Welcome to Fertility and Sterility on Air, the podcast where you can stay current on the latest global research in the field of reproductive medicine. This podcast brings you an overview of this month's journal, in-depth discussion with authors, and other special features. FNS on Air is brought to you by Fertility and Sterility Family of Journals in conjunction with the American Society for Reproductive Medicine and is hosted by Dr. Kurt Barnhart, Editor-in-Chief, Dr. Eve Feinberg, Editorial Editor, Dr. Micah Hill, Media Editor, and Dr. Pietro Bordaletto, Interactive Associate-in-Chief. Hi, this is Eve Feinberg and Kurt Barnhart. Welcome to Fertility and Sterility on air live from ESHRA. Today we're joined by Dr. John Paramo. I'm going to get if you say it, John. Why introduce yourself? <laughs> yeah, so today we are joined by... Gian Piero Palermo from Wild Cornell Medicine. Uh, Philip New Schiff York. from Wild Cornell Medicine. Welcome to the podcast, and we're really excited that you're joining us. So we selected abstracts from all of the abstracts that were presented, and we thought yours was of particular interest, just given... Given the hot topic of genome editing, and we thought that this represented a really interesting model, can you tell us a little bit about your work? The work is about how we use the CRISPR-Cas9 technology to edit not the embryo, the conceptus genome, but more to the gametes genome. Only the sperm is being edited in our study. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about that. So you edited the sperm, and how did you actually do that? So as, uh, as we all know, sperm genome is highly compacted. It lacks its own transcriptional factors and its transcriptional inert. does not have DNA repair or transcription function. Therefore, we use uh, actually the oocyte mechanism to exploit the uh, oocyte transcriptional transcription factors as a tool to add the sperm genome by basically inject the sperm genome with CRISPR-Cas9 into an enucleated oocyte and then by doing so, we only work on the sperm genome, but not interfering with the oocyte or anything with the embryo. So before we get into the specifics, many people that listen are clinicians. So you're actually not injecting a sperm, you're actually injecting just the sperm genome. Correct. Hmm. Without fertilization and egg, without so syngamy. The, the aim is to edit the sperm genome only. So in case of the heterozygote disease or any sort of you know, in a non-homogeneous uh, abnormality of the male gamete. Excellent. In this case, we would avoid mosaicism of the deriving embryo. Excellent. So I'm glad we got the technique up front. So tell me, what was the goal of this? What were you trying? To, what problem were you trying to solve? Because we tried to solve this problem where the sperm is a heterogeneous in terms of a genetic material, such as in case of a, a monoallelic, let's say a monoallelic genetic disease such as autosomal dominant that you see only like half of the gamete may carry the mutation that's pathological. And by using our method, you can actually screen the gamete and then edit accordingly. So if I'm getting this correctly, so if you have a single gene disorder that's carried through the paternal lineage, Correct. rather than doing gene editing on the embryo, you're saying let's do gene editing on that sperm before it fertilizes the egg in order to prevent transmission. Yeah, we, the, the technique that we use in this particular experiment by decondensing the, the male nucleus, you also can clone the particular nucleus and create pseudoblastomere with a copy of the male gamete. So we can do an actual diagnosis on that gamete before utilizing it as a form of pseudoblastomere. So you do the cloning in order to get the diagnosis. You're yes. not actually cloning sperm for it. No, it's just <laughs> no, the clone of the genome. So the copy of the genome. So you can have a copy of that particular sperm, identical sperm, so you know if it's healthy or not. If it's healthy, you could use the healthy one. If it's unhealthy, you can actually edit it. And I can especially envision that would be important in the setting of a female who has diminished ovarian reserve, where you don't have a lot of oocytes to work with, right. therefore you want to attack it from the single sperm Correct. Correct. center. Was that Correct. some of the thought behind the development of this? The actual, the whole aim of the study was the fact that we use more and more genomic analysis on the, on the embryo, but we do on, now on the gamete, particularly in our center, we do a lot of in NGS sequencing, uh, so DNA sequencing on the sperm. So we identify the particular gene involving male infertility or some other abnormality of the male gamete, such as inability to fertilize and stuff in this direction. That can be also more other, you know, like BRCA or other 
abnormal. So once we identify the gene, then what? Our idea is what if we can edit it at the level of the male gland. So you're, you're not just selecting the sperm, you're actually going to try to edit the whatever Correct. mutation you Identifying the sperm right. and then eventually edit But okay. why not just identify the sperm and then use we the We can do both with this technique. It's we can do both. Identify the healthy one, but also if there is no healthy one, then we can edit the one. That is abnormal. Yeah, such as in case which you have a patient that has a hetero, like homozygous, recess, like autosomal recessive disease. If the patient is manifested with this type of disease, then all his gametes will be affected. So that's why we like try to dominant, yeah, you know, like, like a like Marfan syndrome. Yeah. Like if he had cystic fibrosis, he's yeah. going to have two copies, two copies of yeah. Delta 508 or we whatever. We should just cut it off, like here, like just completely eliminate the uh, vertical transmission to the next generation. Yes. So th this is wonderful. We've talked about the reasons and what you can do with it. So tell us tell us some of the results. Where, where yeah. did this lead to? It's more of a proof of concept stage right now that we are doing actually try to knock out a uh, tyrosinase gene from the mouse embryo, from the mouse sperm. So in case of this, the uh, mouse will start producing melanin, which gives it a, a vinyl phenotype. So it's more of like a visually uh, direct kind of approach. We're actually able to generate such mouse already using this approach. Uh, we're actually working on more of a disease model right now, which is the uh, Marfan syndrome, autosomal dominant. So, uh, so we already know how we can select these unaffected embryos, but what about these uh, affected ones? So we try to rescue these affected ones by adopting our CRISPR technique technology into this specific strain of mouse. So how, I understand this is brand new and novel, that's why it's exciting. How efficient have you been able to get the process? You were able to work with most sperm, or it's, it's still, it's still a, a while to find the one that you're able to amplify and work with? As long as it can cleave in the inside and outside, as long as the haploid control can cleave to, let's say, eight cells, we can use it. Uh, the, 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 is about the, the, the correction, the, the correction rate is about 30%, 30 percent. 30 percent, 30 to 40 percent. Yeah. And, and uh, th this is obviously in, my, in mouse work you just described. What what are the hurdles you foresee bringing this to human work? Uh, we definitely have to work on the uh, imprinting of these cloned and edited gametes. That's one of the major concern. And also we are trying to go into more details on how we can tailor this for other types of uh, diseases. The the problem with the, it's just the concept of the centrosome that is different between right. a mouse and the human. But the idea this should be easily replicate in human. Other than the imprinting, the important thing is the centrosome because it may be missed during the, the duplication of the male genome for the editing. So once you decondense the sperm nucleus, you may lose the centrosome and that's important in human. So tell me again, how, what, what are you actually implanting into the egg? It, you said it's, uh, you're, you're putting the DNA directly in, but are you also getting uh, what well, we use We use an enucleated egg. A nucleus, so there is no genome of the egg, we use just the cytoplasm. And the point we inject the sperm, so the sperm genome can be unraveled and then can be edited. That's the idea. We use a kind of a technique to bypass the problem intrinsic of the, the sperm, which is very highly compatible DNA. And then we use after the uh, after the haploid embryo cleaves, the sperm genome replicates, and we can take out some of the cell for uh, sequencing for genotyping, and we can use the rest as a sperm to fertilize the intact cells and to generate the biparental zygotes. Right. That was my next question. So then, how do you extract the DNA from the enucleated oocyte? So well, yeah, once it is, is injected into this enucleated oocyte, we let them cleave. Right? because you need to replicate the DNA in order to edit it. Once it replicates, it forms blastomere like an embryo, but they're all haploid. So two blastomere, four blastomere, eight blastomere, they are all identical copy of the sperm genome. So you can take this blastomere, you can transplant in the perivitaline space of an activated oocyte. So there, there was some recent work with transplanting the, the, the nucleus for, for, for the spindle. And, and one of the issues was that was you were, you were also probably putting in mitochondrial DNA and the, the other, other genetic material from there. Minute amount. It all depends. At that point, it's all a matter of technique. If you refine the technique, the amount of estranged 
my mitochondria, you carry on in very, very minute. Where okay. do you get the enucleated egg from? Like, do you well, this is in the mouse, uh, we eat? actually manually enucleate. But if you were going to do this in you're humans, would you take the partner, or would you use the same egg source that ultimately you're going to put the sperm into? It depends. That actually depends on the the female side. If the female is normal, normal. Uh, right, so you use donor. Very right. reserved. Then we, yeah, we use, her, be a, we use autologously. If, if possibly, if the female has a lower all side reserve, we would just opt for donor eggs. Fascinating work. It, this was a great conversation. Tell us, for the sake of everyone else listening to, what else are you looking forward to seeing in, in, at ESHRI? Oh, looking forward to see. Um, well, just to update, uh, you know, the, a little bit of work is going on. We're very fascinated by automation, I would yeah. say. That's something. I my own a patent at Cornell for for the, the ICSI chip, so an ICSI machine, that, uh, that that's my plan. After developing ICSI, the plan is right, to make so it automatic. and then developed a technique to take the To automate it, to, <laughs> to avoid alien yeah. embryology. So congratulations on your work here at ESHRI. Um, will, you, will we see you at ASRM in a future meeting? Yes, yes, yes of course. All right, looking of course. forward to seeing you then. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. And we are back with another interview. Um, I'm back with Kurt Barnhart, and today we have... Hi, I'm Connie Rees, and I'm a PhD student from the Netherlands, and also an obstetrics and gynecology resident, um, doing my training in Belgium and the Netherlands. And uh, my name is Dick Schout, Benedictus Schout. I'm a gynecologist in Eindhoven, the Netherlands, and in Gent, uh, a research professor. So we went through the abstract book and found what we thought was very interesting abstracts. So we'll give you free reign. Tell us a little bit about why you'd study this and, and your main findings, and we'll go from there. Now, we, we discussed that we have both uh, some time to... Historically, there has been a lot of attention to uh, uterine contractility. has been researched extensively in the last uh, 10 years of the previous uh, century. Uh, but it stopped because it was a subjective measurement by the eye and it was not reproducible in the way that it could be brought to all the uh, gynecologists. So um, they did a lot of research already and they found good correlations but uh, we thought 10 years ago starting to, to uh, combine um, ultrasound speckle tracking if you don't mind I can explain that a bit uh, and bring it into the ultrasound machine to, uh, to measure and characterize uterine uh, dynamics because uterine dynamics is, can tell you something about uh, behavior and about the quality of uh, fertility and normal behavior. That's a great introduction to the background and the methods. Tell me what your hypothesis was in this particular study. So in this particular study we were interested in looking into if uterine contractility differed in women with adenomyosis because as I'm sure most of the listeners know adenomyosis affects the uterine wall and our hypothesis is that because the myometrium is affected in the uterus then the contractility will also be different in women with adenomyosis and maybe this would be an explanation for the symptoms people um, experience or maybe even a therapeutic target or a diagnostic target because sometimes adenomyosis can be very mild but our hypothesis was as well. Maybe you can see very minor changes in the contractility that could also indicate something that's wrong um, with the myometrium and then be able to see if there is a adenomyosis, for example. So with this particular study, we wanted to see um, if the contractility differed in women with adenomyosis compared to women with normal uteri. Um, and we looked at various stages of the menstrual cycle where uh, we compared uh, roughly 70 women with normal uteri with normal menstrual cycles, no dysmenorrhea, no symptoms indicative of adenomyosis, and compared their movements to women with proven adenomyosis on ultrasound or MRI. And so let's talk a little bit about the time points where you yeah. looked at women throughout the menstrual cycle. So I think there were four different time points? Yeah. So we looked around menstruation to so the first five days of the menstrual cycle. We looked at the early follicular phase, the late follicular phase, so sort of around ovulation and then we looked at early luteal and late luteal phases. And in sort of general, we combined sort of luteal as a general phase as well. 
Um, so we had various stages along the menstrual cycle based on the cycle day, because all the women we included also had to have regular menstrual cycles, so that was a... Uh, so at a very high level, before we get into the specific yeah. stages, what did you find in differences between the two groups? So in general, the um, we looked at various features, so amplitude, coordination, contraction frequency, and velocity Perhaps were the ones we looked at. Perhaps you have to explain coordination, exactly. because yeah. that's new. Yeah. So coordination was something that we thought um, would be interesting to look at because basically that was a way of measuring the symmetry and movement between the posterior and the anterior wall of the uterus um, because the uterus we think moves as the intestines sort of do in a peristaltic way so rhythmically up and down the uterus basically um, and we were interested to see okay if adenomyosis probably only would affect one wall more than the other we would expect there to be asymmetry in the movements and that's what we called coordination and eventually the feature in the end as well that was most different between women with adenomyosis and women without, so healthy uteri, was coordination in fact. And we think this is definitely a reflection of um, that one wall is probably more affected than the other. And then this could be an explanation, for example, for the fact that the uterine doesn't behave in the way that you would expect. And perhaps is an explanation for uh, infertility in and some situations. And you did some like, visual analog scale yeah. for women to rate their pain. And yeah. how did that correlate with uterine contractility? So we've been looking into that in adenomyosis patients, but also larger, uh, the study as well, in, for example, with IUD placement to see if this correlates in any way. Our numbers are actually fairly low, or at least our numbers are high enough, but the differences in the, the visual analog scale scores are actually very similar across all groups, which makes it difficult to really know, okay, what is the difference in the women with severe pain or the women with milder pain and of course the women with the adenomyosis usually have more severe pain. So the real differences in, in the visual analog uh, scale scores is difficult to definitively yeah, that, That's a hard now. metric yeah, to, to find the difference. It is. Right. Um, but we do think that um, the women that have higher uh, VAS scores and we've also found that in the, the lower numbers that we have so far um, that that does seem to be, especially with coordination and amplitude, seem to be the, the factors that differ mainly. What, what this afternoon will be presented during the presentation of a poster is that if you give to women yeah. um, uh, who have adenomyosis, progestins or oral contraceptives, you see a normalization of the contraction activity. So there is uh, a tool, as uh, Connie says, to monitor your treatment effectivity, or uh, efficacy. And uh, that, that this tool can help us uh, not only to, to, to diagnose, but also to, to analyze and to uh, judge our treatment and the, uh, the yeah. sense or nonsense. I can't help but wonder acupuncture too. I mean, acupuncture is so widely used for the treatment of pain. Two months ago on the podcast, we reviewed a paper that looked at acupuncture for endometriosis pain. And I wonder if we would see similar findings, like is acupuncture real in terms of its efficacy? And this seems to at least provide a framework by which you can more objectively measure, is it actually doing anything? Well, that's an interesting point. It is very interesting. Yeah, because that's something that would you know, relate to the innovation of the uterus and how that might be affected. And if, that, if changing the innovation, for example, by acupuncture or stimulating it in some way might affect the symptoms. Yeah. But the uterus also has a sort of autonomous nervous system as well just like the intestines do. So it'd be interesting to see how much is exogenously sort of stimulated and how much is actually autonomous and if that's something that's different as well. So we, we spoke of pain, but I'm very interested because you mentioned fertility as well. Yeah. And, uh, and you, we talked about global findings. Did you find um, differences at certain types of the cycle that might affect, uh, you know, oocyte or, uh, or sperm transportation yeah, or things yeah, like that? Or embryo transfer, or embryo, yeah. Yeah, post right. embryo yeah. transfer. Yeah, yeah. Uh, figures so this is sort uh, of outside yeah. the scope of adenomyosis, but in our, in, our, well, in our adenomyosis group, we saw the biggest changes were around ovulation, so the late follicular phase and luteal phase, which is of course, fertility wise, very crucial moments, um, which could affect either the ability to fertilize or uh, eventually embryo implantation. So those were two phases that we sort of hoped um, academically that would show big differences and those were also the phases that we saw the main differences in surprisingly not so much the menstruation phase but definitely those two so that relates to fertility but as well what Dick also mentioned is that the, the project started by looking at IVF patients and to see how the uh, uterine contractility at time of embryo transfer if that differs and if that could predict eventual successful pregnancy during IVF and we did find uh, convincing results as a well. A prediction uh, yeah. success of uh, prediction rate of 
between 70 and nearly 80% uh, depending on the uh, the module that we use. So there, there's supposed to be some contractility at, at the time yeah. of embryo transfer? You yeah. do yeah. definitely because, want some. Because yes. there, there were some drugs tested a few years ago that would soften or delay yeah. uterine contractility thinking that would improve success. But you're, you're actually saying perhaps it's the opposite. Yeah, we think that's a sort of optimal range because... It's, it, de it yeah. depends. It depends on how high the uh, the starting yeah. uh, contractility is. If you have to decrease it by using these drugs, you can you can score your effectivity of yeah. if you use it. Because there have been studies that have looked into this, and not all of them have been completely convincing. But we think that might have something to do with the fact that they don't look at the sort of they don't choose the patients to give the, the for example, the progestins to, or something that would relax the uterus. And not everyone would need it because sort of the first small numbers of patients we included into our IVF cohort we saw that lower contractility was more beneficial but then when we expanded the group actually relatively higher seemed to be also beneficial so that we think there's a range so you don't want too few because you need contractions to sort of keep the embryo in place is sort of a hypothesis but you also need you don't want too many to sort of expel it again. So my colleagues that are listening, I'm sure, are ready to adopt your, your findings. Y you did this very specifically. You have your own metrics. This isn't widespread that you can just add to any ultrasound machine and, and make a measurement now. Okay, so we're busy with an American company who is seriously looking at uh, this uh, measure measurement method after 10 years. It takes three minutes. Uh, you can implement it in a, um, in a uh, ultrasound uh, platform. Uh, any ultrasound platform is uh, appropriate for that. But not yet. You're, you're still working with the company. It's not available at the moment. No, we are testing it. Uh, we are starting to test it in, uh, in, uh, in, 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 in centers. So we started talking about your research in adenomyosis, right? But now we've gotten to contractility for everybody. But you think that this is applicable? Yeah. yeah. We're looking into sort of the, the data that we've collected so far that we're presenting here is mainly adenomyosis based. But we're looking into adenomyosis, endometriosis, leiomyomas. We started with the IVF, so that's continuing. Septa. Septums, congenital, uterine anomalies. Placental remnants. Postmenopausal bleeding. We could go on. Yeah. yeah. It's widely applicable. Fascinating work, and I think part of the reason that we wanted to have you on here was really to highlight what's what we know, what we don't know, and what's coming down the pipeline in terms of innovation. I want to add one thing. We have a lot of help of uh, the group of, uh, of Thessaloniki, who helps us, and Naples, and uh, Amsterdam is helping. A lot of uh, people are supporting the research by implementing patients and videos, so that's very important for us. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. We have the author of this next abstract with us, and the oral abstract is Delta 9 THC acts on the calcium channel, cat sperm, alters human sperm function. So I am joined by Lydia Worley. And Lydia, where are you from? I'm from Switzerland, Geneva, actually. Excellent. So tell us a little bit about what this is. It sounds like you're looking at the effect of THC on sperm. Exactly. So uh, basically what we're looking at is the impact of different phytocannabinoids on sperm. So we actually tested THC and CBD, which are the main components of marijuana. Uh, the, the goal of this research was actually to see whether or not this could alter fertility. And uh, we did this developing a new tool in order to investigate whether or not this could interfere with calcium uh, concentration inside the sperm cell, because calcium is extremely important for fertilization to occur. So why did you even think that this would be an issue? Like what made you hypothesize that the active ingredients of marijuana may be an issue? Yeah, well, actually, we're not the first one who uh, decided to investigate the impact of marijuana on fertility. And actually, a lot of publications have been done. And the problem is that the results are conflicting. So actually, some uh, studies are seeing a decrease in sperm fertility or concentration. Others are seeing the opposite. And actually, in Switzerland, it's a big debate at the moment whether or not we should le uh, legalize marijuana or not. Yeah, what I think is really interesting, and I live in Illinois, which is a legal state, and people use marijuana all the time. Most of the studies that we've come across have looked at exactly that. They looked at motility, they looked at numbers, the results have been conflicting, and what I've wondered is what aren't we seeing? And so where I was really fascinated by your work 
was really looking at the physiologic mechanism of calcium within the sperm. So for our listeners, can you talk a little bit about the receptor and the calcium efflux and what that actually does? Yeah, of course. So actually, uh, so we targeted cat spur. Cat spur is the um, main sperm-specific calcium channel on the sperm membrane. And uh, what it does is that once it's activated, you will have an increase of calcium concentration inside the sperm um, cell. And this will trigger a hyperactivation, which is required for fertilization to occur. It will also uh, induce acrosomal reaction, which is also a key step to fertilization. So what we did is we developed this new method in order to see whether or not the different phytocannabinoids could interfere with the activation of the channel. And uh, either by inducing it a bit too early also, because the timing of uh, inducing this channel is crucial for fertilization, but also if it interfere with the natural activation of the channel, which is done in human actually by progesterone or prostaglandin E1. So we tested both, whether or not it could in, uh, activate on their own or uh, if it could interfere with the lag independent activation. Very comprehensive, I'm impressed. So why don't you tell us a little bit about what you found? Uh, so <laughs> what we found was very interesting. Um, since we tested THC and CBD, because CBD is already legalized and THC is not, we uh, always compared the two molecules. So basically what we saw is that THC and CBD induce a, a small increase of calcium concentration on their own, but they're not as important as the one we observed with progesterone or prostaglandin. So we could kind of say that it, there are neglectable uh, increase. Uh, however, what we could observe is that uh, THC, which was not the case with CBD, interferes with the natural activation of uh, cat spur, meaning that it will inhibit the activation of the channel by progesterone and prostaglandin. And what was even more interesting was that the inhibition of progesterone um, by THC was within pharmacologically relevant concentration. And then we wanted to see whether or not all those Calcium increase and inhibition could also uh, be transferred into uh, sperm function and if we could see some alteration of the sperm functions. So we uh, evaluated uh, the impact of THC and CBD on, t on hyperactivation, sorry, and we saw that THC did inhibit significantly uh, hyperactivation, which was not the case with CBD. And we also saw that, uh, which was quite surprising, that THC induces acrosomal reaction, yeah. which was not the case with CBD. Wow. So how do you, right, I guess my question is, how do you translate that clinically? Like, what does that actually mean in terms of the effect on sperm function? So actually, yeah. this uh, suggests that this is all done in vitro, so it's a bit hard to also extrapolate into uh, in vivo. What we could hypothesize is that um, a person which uh, smokes marijuana on a regular basis uh, could have uh, alteration in sperm functions, meaning that maybe this man will have normal semen analysis. However, at the um, um, uh, molecular level, this will not be, um, well, he will be, let's say, penalized in his fertility. Uh, meaning that, uh, for example, you will have a decrease of motility in the sperm cells, but not the overall motility that is assessed during a normal semen analysis. Most likely it will be a, an inhibition of hyperactivation. And also the big issue with the acrosomal reaction is that once it is induced a bit too early, it could also decrease fertility. Yeah, so would you counsel patients at this point to stop, infertile patients who come in for a visit, would you say stop using marijuana based on these data? Yes, I think that would be a, a great, um, um, how do you say this? Uh, Counseling nugget. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if we were to follow on the counseling, what can you speculate the, the duration of effect? I mean, is this a, an immediate effect or something that will wear off over days, weeks, months? So um, everything that has an alteration with the sperm usually, uh, with mature sperm, uh, usually wears off uh, after one or two cycle, full cycle of spermatogenesis. So um, I would suggest that if a patient comes, uh, an infertile patient comes and he consumes marijuana on a daily basis, I would recommend that he stops for three to six months um, and in order to redo all the semen analysis and make sure that his fertility is back up. So uh, a few years ago, there was a lot of work on caffeine and its effect on sperm function in, in very similar parameters. What, what's the magnitude of effect here? Are we talking a greater effect or a lesser effect than the effect that was purported for caffeine? 
So I'm not quite familiar with the caffeine uh, study. I don't re recall exactly the, um, the results. So I couldn't really say. Um, what is very important, and this is the, the main thing to keep in mind, is that the concentration at which we saw some effect in vitro were extremely low. Concentration going uh, until yeah, 10 nanomolar. So this is extremely low in concentration that we find um, in, the, in the blood in, of um, uh, people who are consuming are much higher than the ones. But are the effects it. dramatic yeah. also, or just the level at which you see effects? Small effects at low levels or large effects? No, so we still see significant effects, so we still have. But I guess my question is, so if it's going to impact hyperactivation, that's necessary for natural fertilization. Exactly. And so if you have this couple who has otherwise, quote, unexplained infertility, and they do, they utilize IVF and ICSI, would you overcome the effect, the negative effect of cannabis by doing ICSI? And not that I'm purporting that we don't, um, not that I'm recommending not stopping, but if somebody doesn't stop, could you utilize technology to overcome this particular barrier? So based on our study, I would say yes, but we would need some further investigation just to make sure that also uh, DNA fragmentation has not been altered or other parameters that could also affect the outcome of the embryo. Fascinating. So I would argue that just because something is legal doesn't necessarily mean that it's safe. And I think that those two are should not be conflated. Exactly. <laughs> Wonderful work. We hope we'll see it published in Fertility and Serility someday. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. And I am back. This is Eve Feinberg, and I'm joined by Ann Steiner. And the next oral presentation that we're going to be talking with the author is a method for mapping sex-specific meiotic crossovers from PGTA data elucidates the role of aberrant recombination in the origins of aneuploidy. So here with me is Svetlana Majunkova. And where are you from? I'm coming from Toronto, um, uh, Canada, and I work at Create Fertility Center. So tell us a little bit about your work, um, and specifically, what are you looking at, and why is this important in terms of the origins of aneuploidy? Okay, so I, I will start where uh, we're coming from. Uh, basically, in current clinical practice, we see more and more uh, utilization of pre-implantation genetic testing for aneuploidy, and with this, we see a huge um, number of patients affected with uh, embryos that um, have aneuploidy. Uh, so over the years, we have tested probably more than 40,000 uh, embryos, and we have a range of um, ages of women uh, that went through IVF process and produced embryos. So it gives us a perfect opportunity to study the um, occurrence of aneuploidy uh, at ages starting from 20 years up to 46 years. So I, I and, and being a geneticist and really interested in the origins or, or the why infertility is happening, I think um, this spurred the um, uh, interest uh, into understanding why. And another thing is that um, our collaborators from John Hopkins, uh, Dr. Um, Rajiv McCoy, who is um, leading the bioinformatic, who is leading the bioinformatic um, uh, efforts in this study and developing the algorithms to analysis, you know, uh, the, the long discussions around this topic really led to uh, starting this project and um, the post, the presentation that we have at ESHRAE. And can you tell us a little bit about the presentation? What were some of the things that you found that you thought were interesting? So I would say that um, what we're presenting here are uh, the results from the method that was uniquely developed uh, to be able to use the very sparse uh, data from shallow sequencing that we do for PGTA. And I think the uniqueness of this method is that it utilizes the relatedness of the samples uh, from the PGTA, basically analyzing the sibling embryos, and also it, it uses the 
data that is already available uh, from uh, genome uh, repositories um, uh, such as Decode uh, Project and Thousand Genome Project. Project. So we utilized that information and we created uh, an algorithm to be able to infer the crossovers and map the, the crossovers in um, our data set. So by employing this, we were able to uh, map uh, over 70,660 crossovers uh, in our data set from 18, over 18,000 embryos. And what we saw is that uh, maternal uh, genome has 35% reduction in crossovers. It, maternally inherited uh, trisomies have 35% reduction in crossovers compared to disomies, uh, which was um, a very interesting finding. And on top of that, we did see that um, in addition to the reduction of the number of of crossovers, we also see a different distribution, which is chromosome specific of these crossovers. For example, for chromosome 16, we see reduction of um, crossovers around the centromere on both arms, uh, whereas this reduction uh, is less prominent uh, on chromosome 22. Um, actually, in chromosome 22, we have increase in Q arm, uh, uh, the distal end of the Q arm, increasing crossovers. What is the relationship between crossovers and aneuploidy? Oh, that's a good question. I should have probably started with that. Uh, so, female uh, meiosis or oocyte meiosis uh, starts uh, uh, at fetal development very early on, and, and it's uh, stalled at um, prophase one when the chromosomes, uh, chromatid pairs to form bivalent. So, the crossovers are fundamental for genomic di diversity and establishing the crossovers really ensures that the diversity or the recombination happens but also it um, ensures proper segregation at the next steps of the um, uh, uh, depletion of the genome. Right, and so you have a whole chromosome meiosis. or you can have premature separation of sister chromatids. And how much of that is related to the degree of crossovers in the individual chromosomes? So um, some of them are related. So the mechanistic background of these uh, differences are definitely related to the number of uh, crossovers and, um, and the positioning um, in the chromosome. Uh, it is seen that the premature segregation of uh, sister chromatids, which is associated very much with advanced maternal age, is uh, proportionally related with the number and the positioning of the um, uh, crossovers. Maybe less uh, so with the M1 non disjunction, which is more prominent or more prevalent in younger patients. So in, with what your findings were in this study, um, did you find a difference that's all, is this all age related or did you find a difference in the reductions by age? Was this yes, so we, we did see um, relatedness with, um, with age, however, because of the, the because of the, the, the number, you really need to have huge numbers to be able to get this statistical significance and, and properly measure. And you can imagine uh, analyzing each chromosome, uh, you know, does, um, uh, we needed to factor in for the multiple combinations and applying the Bonferroni uh, correction uh, really didn't get us the desired significance, but the trend is there. And we do see that there is a maternal age effect that uh, probably will be uh, seen with a larger data set. But I think that the method that we, that we validated and applying it in a real, um, in a real data set, uh, being able to infer the type of uh, meiotic uh, error and also get the, the number, the distribution of the, of the crossovers uh, over the genome and specifically positioning it, you know, at the, um, uh, positioning it on the chromosome arms, I think it gives powerful tool to 
apply it widely and uh, probably probe some of the questions that we all have, uh, basically understanding the genetic basis of um, uh, occurrence of aneuploidy and how this affects uh, infertility in general. Yeah, no, I was going to say this is really interesting. And was there something other than validating the method, do you think there's some clinical application for what you learned? So I, I feel it is, um, it is important to, to understand that uh, knowing or, or going to the source of the problem probably will give us uh, room to think of how we can correct it or uh, where is the um, possibility for intervention. Uh, one of the very uh, low-hanging fruits for, for this type of method um, as we have now, I think it's, it's a possibility to be uh, applied in uh, pre-implantation testing for monogenetic disorders uh, that rely on uh, haplotyping of the maternal and paternal inheritance. And I think that this is um, valuable because the data comes from um, a sequencing that is shallow. Um, it is probably more, it's deeper than a regular PGTA. We sequence at around 0.1x uh, depth of coverage. Uh, however, it is still uh, less than what is needed to establish um, haplotyping with uh, SNP type uh, with SNP sequencing that requires more than 8x uh, coverage. So it, there is benefit, like re, um, very Im, uh, immediate use. But I feel like um, in more general concept, understanding what is the cause and how we can address um, occurrence of uh, aneuploidy, we may look at ways to treat uh, or first better counsel, uh, counsel um, patients um, coming to see us clinically for treatment and also uh, opportunities to find treatments and um, different ways to deal with uh, aneuploidy. Were there any patients that you found that were outliers in terms of percent aneuploidy? Were there some patients that had 100% aneuploidy or some patients, conversely, that had extremely low rates of aneuploidy? Correct. We, we do see these are very rare uh, cases. We do see, uh, we, we did have a uh, few patients, uh, especially one with um, predominant uh, polyploidy in their embryos, which is a different type of um, a segregation error. And we also see patients that um, have higher proportion of euploid embryos or, or lesser uh, proportion of aneuploids that are um, outliers. But this is not too much. Obviously, the, number, the numbers are key here. So definitely pulling together bigger data sets would uh, probably provide answers to you know, genetic, and, and allow us to decipher the genetic basis of, of um, that regulates the, these segregation errors. Right, and I think that the ultimate hope really is to figure out how are these regulated and how do we, how can we fix them or can we do something that would, that would prevent more aneuploidy in the future? Exactly, and, and I think that with uh, advanced uh, postponing uh, parenthood, puts us in a very difficult position where we need to counsel and treat patients for for which at the moment we don't have any tools other than selecting embryos that don't have aneuploidy. So being able to do something about that, I think it's the, it's the key and goal. <laughs> yeah, to modify the egg in exactly. some way. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. It was You're a pleasure welcome. speaking with you and congratulations on your wonderful report. Thank you. It was, it was a pleasure to talk to you as well. The title of this next abstract is using ChatGPT to answer patient questions about fertility, the quality of information generated by deep learning language model. And I am joined by... I'm Dr. Kerry Bilby. I'm a researcher and educator at Monash University in Australia. Um, and yeah, we did this kind of, I'd say it's quite a small study. It's kind of a very early probing study just to see what ChatGPT is doing because we're hearing more and more about well, we have an issue with students using it a lot, so that's kind of where we think about it. But um, fertility patients definitely 
one of their will become one of their first points of call, I think, for information and decision making. I think the chat GPT is about to replace Dr. Google. <laughs> yeah. Which I think is any fertility specialist and anyone listening knows is probably the bane of our existence. And so I read your abstract with interest. I thought it was incredibly timely and such a great topic. And I think ultimately, if ChatGPT can answer these questions, it would be great, but it sounds like we're not there yet and probably not that close to being there. So tell us a little bit about what you looked at and what you found. I think we might be closer than you think, which is kind of a scary idea. Um, So I think there's a couple of things to think about. Um, And of course, it depends on how much time people have spent learning about ChatGPT. I think there's two kind of common misconceptions about ChatGPT, and that is that it searches the internet for you in real time and just gives you a Google search, which is incorrect. And also, it doesn't really do calculations. And I think that's an interesting one in the medical field because a lot of the way we talk about data, talk about results, give information to people for decision making comes through numbers. ChatGP doesn't do that, it predicts language. And so I think because it's an algorithm and it's a computer, we assume that it can make good choices around numbers and it cannot. So that's an interesting point to put out there. Um, But yeah, we did a study where we took 10 really common fertility questions. So these were questions that we knew were being asked on forums, they'd been posted on blogs, they were on clinic websites as FAQs. And we asked ChatGPT and we then took the answers it gave us and we put together a a scoring matrix that allowed us to look at the uh, the content of the data and how accurate the content was and the quality of the data. And uh, you don't have to list all 10 questions, but can you give us an example of one or two of those questions? Absolutely. So I think the first question we asked was, what's my chance of becoming a father as I get older? So really simple kind of stuff, used in very natural, patient-focused language, nothing too scientific. Um, just really what we were pulling off sites, so what a patient would naturally ask. We had five different categories, so we talked about, we asked about fertility awareness, we asked about um, infertility treatment, so what are my chances of getting pregnant through IVF, for example. We asked about uh, elective egg freezing, is it worth it? We asked about add-ons, we asked about specific infertilities like PCOS. Um, And of course, all of these areas have Uh, literature that indicates there might be particular commercial bias or controversy or even just that there's dogmatic information there that we we know that as you get older your fertility declines so looking at these things we wanted to see what ChatGPT would do and we were really surprised at how well it performed now I and I and you know it's not what we were looking for and I love that kind of thing we kind of thought yeah we'll put it through the ringer and then we'll get a couple of experts to score it and it scored really well so yeah. <laughs> so my question is, you know, has this kind of been done with Google or TikTok and how might it compare? Have you seen what other data is there out there? I mean, I'm just sitting here saying, well, should we be, you know, I mean, sending people instead of to Dr. Google to chat GPT. What is, do you know the data about some of the other and how this might compare? Yeah, so I mean, what what we did with some of the questions that scored very poorly is we put them through a Google search to see what Google would give us after we'd seen what ChatGPT would give us. And Google gave us better results. It gave us kind of a long list of reliable websites, independent websites, um, patient-focused websites. So we got kind of closer information off them. But we had to go to 10 websites to do it. And, you know, ChatGPT, once it gets a bit better at, you know, what's happening, I think it will be a good tool. The thing is... And this is where this whole thing comes in, is that uh, we don't know what data has been used to train it. And so we can go to Google, we can kind of track, you know, we can reference where the information's coming from. We still don't always know if it's accurate. You still have to kind of cross-reference and think about it. But with, um, uh, with ChatGPT, it would give us answers kind of pretty spot on. It's just there was a few little things that would kind of alarm us as to what what was going on. And usually they were to do around numbers. So it didn't give us accurate proportions or statistics. Um, But having said that, it was really well balanced too. I mean, a lot of websites that promote fertility treatments or infertility treatments, I should say, they often promote the one thing that they're selling. Whereas ChatGPT would look at a whole range of things and say, well, Have you assessed your finances? Have you assessed your psychological safety? Have you thought about whether or not you need this? Have you talked to a counsellor? So it gave us very rich, some of them were quite rich answers, which we were surprised by and kind of enlightened by as well. It's interesting. Yeah. 
I mean, I would love to envision a world where we could generate patient education documents from ChatGPT instead of every clinic and every practice trying to generate their own. And I, I think it's coming. I think if um, you know a group like ASRM or ESHRAE, if you had a, a large group that was actually choosing the data that this machine was trained on, you'd get really high quality, well kind of thought through information coming out of it. The problem is at the moment I use the free ChatGPT OpenAI thing. I have no idea how it's been trained. I have no idea how it's been manually kind of groomed through human use. Um, so it really, this study, it's interesting, but it's kind of only relevant as of February 2023 because already we've seen, you know, ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 on the market. And so it's ever changing, but I think it gives us a good kind of starting indication as to what's happening. Yeah, well, I thought it was a really interesting hypothesis and a really timely and interesting study. So Thank you very much. We enjoyed Thank doing you it. Thank so much for coming and speaking <laughs> with us today. You're very welcome. Thank you so much. This next abstract is titled Transdermal Testosterone Prior to Ovarian Stimulation for In Vitro Fertilization in Women with Poor Ovarian Response, a multi-center, multinational, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial, the T-Transport. And I am joined by Ann Steiner and... Professor Nicolas Polizos from Barcelona, Spain. I'm the head of the reproductive medicine department in Duxeos University Hospital. So tell me a little bit about why people think that androgens might possibly influence response to ovarian stimulation? Well, we have evidence from animal studies. Everything started a long time ago. We have evidence from animal studies that it can increase the number of follicles or the pregnancy rates. And then we started the small observational studies supporting possibly DHA or testosterone. And subsequently, they came the meta-analysis. But we were really uh, a little stuck with many small randomized trials and many meta-analyses, and we missed the real evidence that generate clinical practice, which is big randomized trials. Exactly, and I feel like people have been using, in clinical practice, testosterone prior to IVF stimulation for quite some time without randomized trials. And off-label use also. Eh? So we presented in 2018 in Estre, a survey that has been done uh, in uh, Europe and in Australia, and we have found that 27% of the clinicians are using DHA, and 45 they were using testosterone, off-label totally. Can you tell us a little bit about the design of your trial and why you chose the uh, type of testosterone that you did? Yeah, lovely. So yes, the design has been done, right? it's a study that lasting seven years actually, and we had the COVID that stopped the recruitment. The design started in 2015 and we decided to, to select a specific dose and a specific duration. Why this happened? Uh, first of all, transdermal gel was the one from the animal studies that gel, testosterone, that showed the actual effect on the androgen receptor. We know very well that the, the follicles have androgen receptors. Testosterone is the one that's binding with the androgen receptor. It's actually the key to the lock and not DHA. DHA needs to be metabolized and form testosterone to act on the receptor. So that's why we selected the gel. In terms of duration, we, we actually applied two months of administration, and this is because on follicular genesis in humans, you actually need to give like 60 days because the androgen receptors appear in the primary and secondary follicles. So the transition to the andral follicles lasts more or less two and a half or three months. And the dose, was 5.5, contrary to all the literature. Why? <laughs> I was planning to, to do it with 12.5. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I met with Susan Davis, who is the uh, president of the Menopausal Society, and we were discussing, because she has experience in menopausal women. She has done New England studies published in menopausal women with testosterone. She told me, don't go so high. So we selected 5.5, and eventually we've seen that this was the best dose because we didn't have many side effects or no serious adverse event that would mean drop out. And so the selection for the trial, you used poor ovarian responders. How did you define a poor responder for the purpose of this trial? Well, at this moment, there were the Bologna criteria, which was a famous trend came, and we started with this, which is the worst prognosis patients. So we recruited patients based on the Bologna criteria, 18 to 43 years old, uh, undergoing an IVF cycle. And what did you find in the trial? No difference. 
really? the beauty of no difference. So we found pregnancy rates that they're exactly the same. We found when we split, because the um, randomization was stratified according to age, we didn't find any difference in any of the age groups, but also no difference in cancellation rates, in pregnancy rates, nothing. So, and we're analyzing now live births to have results, but it's the absolute no difference. Is that what you were expecting to find, or did you think that there would be a difference? Well, always when we start, we hope that we will have something positive. Uh, but I think it's very important that I didn't find any difference. Uh, what I'm always telling when we're doing, we're running several randomized trials now in, in the Seuss, and I always want to either revive or kill stories, because this is our, uh, our way of working as scientists and clinicians. Now, did you think that it was going to make a difference in the quality or the quantity? And do you have proof, either one way or the other, that it affects or doesn't affect one or the other? So one systematic review that we published uh, one year ago in American Journal of Obstetrics of Gynecology, we have seen that there is not such a great difference in the quantity. We're talking about 1 oocyte, 0.94 oocytes more with testosterone based on the meta-analysis. And, but it was doubling the live birth rates, the pregnancy rates. So we would expect that we find a difference in the quality. Uh, quantity, uh, if you don't have a lot, you cannot generate so many. But we failed in both, completely. Did anybody have PGT or did you look at aneuploidy rates? No, we didn't, we didn't check aneuploidy rates because at the point was not the, the scope to find aneuploidy rates. But still, how can a drug that doesn't affect anything will affect aneuploidy rate? I strongly doubt about this. So do you think people are going to stop using testosterone after the results of this trial are published? I think they must. <laughs> <laughs> but we have some studies. I understand that there is always there are believers and there are non-believers. And if we have hope, we want to be non-believers and have another formulation or a little change that we will find a difference. Uh, I'm not uh, that kind of person. I like to be based on evidence. We have, uh, for all these 300 patients that we randomized, we have blood samples four times during the testosterone administration to check AMH. We have uh, blindly done an ultrasound control to check under follicle count. We have follicular fluid to check what's happening inside the follicle. We have granulosa cells. So it's a big study that tries to see if there, in any aspects we will have a difference. And more importantly, we have libido data. We did questionnaires and we would like to see if in the end, can improve the libido, this can be. We had spontaneous pregnancies there. Right, I was going to say, it might not improve the ART pregnancy rate, but it might have improved the spontaneous pregnancy rate. Absolutely. We, we, we don't know. It's, it's a black box always, a randomized trial. Yeah, well, I just wanted to congratulate you on a study very well done, and thank you so much for taking the time to come speak with us today. Thank you so much, and thanks to Fertility Reality for, for organizing this. This next oral presentation is What is the True Potential of 1PN Embryos? A report on utilization and live birth rates following PGTA and biparental testing. And I am joined by... Claire Usher, I'm a senior embryologist at Jenea in Melbourne, Australia. So Claire, tell us a little bit about what you thought you would find when you did this study and why did you do this study? Well, it really came about that I was having lunch with a group of other embryologist friends and we all work at different clinics and inevitably the topic of work came up and someone mentioned 1PNs and I was astounded to find out that there were still a lot of clinics that were discarding their 1PN embryos and that wasn't something that we were doing at my clinic and I've then found out there's a whole range of different ways that clinics are treating 1PN embryos when they discover them, and especially at fertilisation check it kind of develops a cascade of different options you have. Um, at Jenea we had previously, so about five years ago, we developed a protocol for using 1PN embryos where we kept them on, cultured them to day five and performed PGTA and biparental inheritance testing to use them. But there were still a lot of clinics in Australia that are discarding these embryos without using them or they're allowed to be transferred fresh, but only if it's the only embryo that the patient has and they have nothing else. And there's a real kind of mix of options that people are dealing with 1PNs. Just for our, we have a broad audience. Yeah. We have some medical students who listen. We have some, we have a lot of reproductive endocrinology and infertility fellows who listen. What is a 1PN embryo and why are we worried about it? So when uh, we've, 
uh, collected eggs, we've inseminated them either with ICSI or IVF and the embryologist is going to perform that fertilisation check 16 to 18 hours post uh, insemination. And at that time, us as embryologists are looking for these two small circles, which are called pronuclei in an embryo. And we believe when we're seeing those two small circles that that's the genetic material, one from the sperm and one from the egg. About 5% of the time, we're only seeing one circle. Traditionally, these one circles or 1PN embryos were thought to be uh, self-activated or parthenogenic. So they're not having, we always thought they don't have the right amount of genetics. They're, they're self-activated, they're parthenogenic. That's why we don't want to use them. That was a, a long time ago. Over the previous years, there's been lots of studies showing not all of those embryos that are only showing 1PN are actually parthenogenic. And there's lots of different models of how the reason that the embryo is only showing one pronuclear could be that they are showing two but we're not seeing them at the right time point so it's asynchronous in their pronuclear formation it could be a multitude of issues with the envelope that encloses the pronuclear so some of these embryos we know have the right genetic material but they're in one circle rather than two circles um, and so traditionally because we always thought they were parthenogenic and that can lead to moral of pregnancies and is a really unwanted outcome for our patients we thought all of these must be like that so we're just going to discard all of them. So then what happened? What, did, what was your clinic protocol and how did you start transferring them or how did you decide that you were going to do PGT and tell me a little bit more about what you've learned. So uh, <laughs> previously I think we were one of these clinics as well that were, it was doctor derived if they've only got this one embryo can we not transfer it can we do testing on it um, and we published a small scale pilot study back in 2017 um, showing that we, we cultured these 1PNs on and did the genetic testing on them and showed that they do have the potential for live birth, they have the potential to get to where we want and really uh, reiterated other people's information that they published showing that they're not all parthenogenic and so that we shouldn't be treating them all the same. So um, can you talk a little bit about how frequently you found 1PNs? And then um, from my understanding, there were differences as to um, whether there was normal, you know, fluidity based on whether or not um, IVF versus ICSI. Some of even these statistics, I thought, just themselves were interesting. Yeah, so um, we are finding about 1%, or, sorry, we're finding about 5% of the oocytes that we're inseminating were being identified as these 1PNs um, at the time of fertilization check. Uh, in our clinic, we exclusively, exclusively use time lapse. So we were then able to eliminate anything that showed a late second PN. So these are true 1PNs that were that only ever displayed a single pronuclei. So both in IVF and ICSI insemination, it's just a little bit over 5% of embryos that were as 1PNs. Um, we then found as we were culturing them on, there was a big difference between the blastocyst rate and ultimate utilisation rate. Um, so the IVF embryos were much more likely to reach the blastocyst stage and be suitable for us to biopsy than the uh, ICSI embryos. So IVF embryos, about 20% of those were usable, so suitable for biopsy, where it was only about 8% of the ICSI embryos. So we saw a really big difference in the two groups. And then with the, the ploidy results and the biparental inheritance results, again, the IVF embryos did a lot better. So about 50% of the IVF embryos that we biopsied came back as normal, as euploid embryos. And then we only saw a 2% rate or even less than 2% for, um, for uh, uniparental inheritance. So in those IVF embryos, we're only seeing about 2% of them are actually parthenogenic. The rate was a lot higher. We were about 20% uniparental inheritance in the ICSI group. Um, so that's really made us think that the mechanism of the types of 1PNs we're seeing must be very different in the two groups. Um, even accounting for the different utilizations, you're still about four times more likely for an ICSI 1PN embryo to be uniploidy, uh, sorry, to be uniparental. So that parthenogenic, you're about four times more likely for an ICSI embryo to be parthenogenic. So once you did PGT and you saw that these embryos were euploid, how did the clinical pregnancy rate of these embryos compare to the clinical pregnancy rate of 
two PN embryos. Yeah. So the they were pretty much the same. It is a low number that we've been able to transfer. So at the moment we've had 175 transfers of these tested embryos over the last five years, um, and our pregnancy rate's about 50 uh, percent for that. Uh, sorry, yeah, about 50 percent uh, or a little bit higher for positive beta HCG. Um, and then live birth for the IVF embryos is sitting about 40 percent. So, so I, I guess my question is, what do you think explains what we're calling or what you're calling a 1PN? Is it a true 1PN or do you think that you're just not seeing the other pronuclei? I think that we're just not seeing or there's some sort of morphological abnormality in that embryo. Where it, so it's, an ab, it's a morphological abnormality, not a genetic abnormality, particularly in the IVF group. Um, and that one of the things that we've really worked out from this study is that a euploid embryo doesn't care what you called it at FERT check. It doesn't, the embryologist calling it a 1 p.m. at FERT check doesn't actually change its ability if it's a euploid embryo to have a live birth at the end of the day. Yeah, I think it's fascinating and I, I have to go back and look at what we do in our lab, but I, I don't think that we're using 1 p.m. embryos. And so I think that part of why I was so interested in your data was to see is there more hope for these embryos than we had initially thought? Yes, I definitely believe there is a lot more hope. Uh, the 69 live births we've had out of these embryos so far, I believe you talk to any one of those patients, they'll urge you to be using 1PNs. But my, I mean, but I think, sorry, this is a little bit off, but 40% live birth rate in a PG, in a euploid embryo is a little bit lower, which might suggest that there is more behind yeah. than the genetics and that there is some of this morphology yeah. may suggest that there there is some value to it, although it's certainly not zero. And I think 40% is pretty groundbreaking yeah, and, and important to use it, but just showing there's more to genetics, more yeah, than no, just the genetics. Fair, yeah. But I think, yeah. you know, sort of like the mosaic embryos that yeah. we used to discard, yeah. I think probably the practice of most clinics is not to use these 1PN embryos. And so what I really took away from this is don't discard those 1PN embryos and give them a chance. Yeah, and I really feel that they've kind of categorized all these different types of embryos into this 1PN category that they might not actually be there. They're not parthenogenic, that we're giving them a diagnosis of 1PN and discarding them and there can be perfectly fine embryos in there. Can I push you even further? Would you transfer a 1PN IVF embryo without testing it? Personally, I wouldn't because I'm very cautious. As a scientist, I, I think in Australia we tend to be very, very cautious. You, the, um, we don't like doing a double embryo transfer. We get Us as scientists get very worried about doing a double embryo transfer, so we're a lot more cautious. Um, if I think you asked the same question to American uh, embryologists, they would probably say yes. Well, I mean, but I mean, based on the data, I mean, yeah. So the question would be, what is about a 2% chance of um, parthenogenic. Yeah, I guess the yeah. question that I have mm -hmm. is whether or not that embryo that is parthenogenically activated, would it just not implant or yeah. would it become, yeah. could it be a molar? molar. Yeah, um, we, we were seeing that some of them, uh, I think when I um, extrapolated some data, if you're doing transfers without testing and trying to extrapolate from what we knew, you would get um, about a half a percent of these embryos would form a morella pregnancy. So, but it's still, a, it's an adverse risk that we never want to go near. Yeah. yeah, but I think that the idea of not discarding them and doing PGT is a rational, is a rational way to handle yeah. this. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so really much for having me. Time. Our next abstract we're talking about is biopsy-free profiling of the uterine immune system in patients with a recurrent pregnancy loss and unexplained infertility. I am joined by... Kilian Womstein from the Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Unit in Copenhagen. And uh, Pia Igewab also from uh, the Recurrent Pregnancy Loss Unit in Copenhagen. Thank you so much for joining me. Tell, tell us a little bit about what your abstract talked about and what you learned in the process. Yeah, so um, we set out to um, analyze the uterine immune system in a non-invasive way, whereas um, usually in uterine immune diagnostics, uterine biopsies are taken 
we ask ourselves, um, should we do menstrual blood analysis? Because these women that actually get taken the biopsy, they shed their inner lining of the uterus every month. So we ask ourselves, can we use that um, menstrual blood to analyze the in uterine immune system? And in comparison to earlier studies, we used a little bit of a different approach where we took endometrial biopsies and menstrual blood to kind of compare these both, whereas earlier studies used uh, historical comparison for that. So let me get this straight. Instead of doing an endometrial biopsy, what you did was collect menstrual blood, kind of like through a menstrual cup or a diva cup collection method. Exactly. It's a basic menstrual cup that it has been used in the within the last years, I think, uh, more and more as a um, menstrual tool, basically, um, instead of menstrual pads or tampons. And that's the menstrual cup um, our participants collected menstrual blood in. And we used that blood and isolated uh, immune cells out from that menstrual blood. And so you basically were able, instead of doing an endometrial biopsy to collect tissue, you collect menstrual blood, save the women the agony, <laughs> the pain, the discomfort, the additional office visit of having an endometrial biopsy, correct? Yes, that is correct. That's fascinating. And so you collected the menstrual blood at two different time points, right? So tell our listeners a little bit about the technique that you used to collect and then how you compared that to an endometrial biopsy sample. Yeah, so the women collected menstrual blood in 12 hours intervals from the start of their period in 12 hours interval and then um, instead of steering the blood into the toilet, they put it in tubes, a tube from the day one of the menstrual blood and a tube for day two. And then on day three, they deliver it to us at the hospital and then we were able to isolate the cells in the, in the lab directly. And when you isolated the cells in the lab, what cells were you looking for in that sample? Immune system cells, uh, lymphocytes. So we basically um, used a density gradient centrifugation to isolate the immune cells like you would do in the peripheral blood um, with a yeah, adapted protocol using that um, adapted protocol. We isolate the, the lymphocytes and then used flow cytometry to identify these cells and we concentrated on basic lymphocyte subsets such as natural killer cells, T cells, B cells and uh, some of the subtypes of CD56 positive NK cells. And how did that compare your collection of lymphocytes and peripheral cells? Or let me say that again. How did that compare your collection of immune cells from menstrual effluvian or menstrual blood compared to an endometrial biopsy? Actually, you didn't have to correct yourself because we also collected peripheral blood. <laughs> <laughs> so <Okay. laughs> we collected peripheral and menstrual blood um, and compared it to the, um, at least in a sub part of our patients, we compared it to the menstrual biopsies. And what we could see is that the first 24 hours of menstrual bleeding um, was comparable to the um, endometrial biopsies. And that also makes sense because within the first 24 hours, you kind of think that the um, patient sheds their inner lining, the endometrium, and after that, it's more like a wound healing. And that is something we could see that the longer we collected the blood, also in test samples, the more it would look like peripheral blood. Right, I mean, if you think about the spiral arteries healing, your first probably day of menstrual shedding is shedding that endometrium, and then you have your spiral arteries and the blood flow, which is probably more reflective of the blood supply that you would see peripherally, and that makes sense intellectually. Exactly, you see kind of a mixture of, of both, and you could see it very clearly within the um, CD56 and K-cell subsets when you say, okay, the more cytoregulatory CD56 bright, CD16 dim, they are, we know that they are high in the endometrium and they are low in the peripheral blood. And that's exactly what we could see in the menstrual blood as well. And then also we could see that shift after 24 hours that it was going back towards the peripheral phenotype. So that is actually quite interesting. Yeah, that, that is. And so it's pretty much reflective of what you would see in the luteal phase of the preceding cycle, correct? 
exactly. just prior to getting a period or just prior to shedding. Exactly. And um, I mean, we're not the first ones looking at the menstrual blood in that case, but what we were the first ones were to really compare their own protocol um, to the endometrial biopsies that were also analyzed by the same protocol. And um, what is quite striking to me, um, I've been working quite some time on endometrial biopsies and immunohistochemistry, and there's a lot of uh, talk about you know, the changes throughout the cycle and then also towards the end of the cycle that you see an even higher increase in, in K-cells, for example. And what I thought was interesting was that we could still compare them, the menstrual blood to the endometrial biopsies, that there was not such a huge shift within the in the uh, percentages. What prompted you to look at this specifically? Um, you mean w how the idea came up, or I mean yeah, the, like the whole idea? The whole idea is uh, to have a no, non-invasive way, right? And that's also basically in the in the title of the paper, um, because of course, if you take an endometrial biopsy once that is probably okay, right? It is painful um, and it is not nice to do, but um, like neither for the patient nor for us as, as practitioners. But the question is, if we have patients in an immunomodulatory treatment, for example, where we would like to see a result of the therapy, we would have to biopsy again, to do a biopsy again. And if we could just collect menstrual blood and analyze that as a proxy basically um, why not just use that instead of undertaking a biopsy every time again and again also introducing something into the uterus we're talking a lot about microbiome at the Eschwer so maybe we're also doing harm and if we can just use it why not just use it yeah and what about the ability to look at neutrophils or cd138 staining to look for endometritis were you able to look at any of those markers i know those are a little bit more controversial as well yeah i mean uh, chronic endometritis is one of the big topics right and um actually it's not part of our panel so i can't really um say something about that. I mean, we know it's IgA producing cells, the plasma cells, so we should kind of be able to do it. I can't, I can just speculate from what we're doing now. I mean, we would just have to look at it. Um, of course, the menstrual shedding and all these processes that take part when the menstruation initiates could also have an effect on, uh, on these plasma cells. But yeah, basically, I don't know, but it's super interesting and I think we should look at it. Next year at Ashray. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> next year at Ashray. That. What do you think are some of the future directions for this work? I think the future direction is exactly what I said about the um, therapeutic options and that we could should kind of look into immunomodulatory treatments, for example, um, and see, do we see any changes there? Um, in patients that receive a treatment and that we can monitor over over several cycles and that is also the picture I got after the talk actually by the questions yeah fascinating well thank you so much for sharing your work with us I'm really thrilled that we were able to get you to come on the podcast I think that it really has tremendous potential to decrease the number of endometrial biopsies that we are doing in patients and I can tell you it is invasive and painful and if we can do something to make a diagnosis with less pain and less discomfort that's a huge win for women perfect thank you very much thanks thank for you. inviting us thank you this concludes our episode of fertility and sterility on air brought to you by fertility and sterility in conjunction with the american society for reproductive medicine this episode was produced by dr michael simoni and dr molly cornfield this podcast was developed by Fertility and Sterility and the American Society for Reproductive Medicine as an educational resource and service to its members and other practicing clinicians. While the podcast reflects the views of the authors and the hosts, it is not intended to be the only approved standard of practice or to direct an exclusive course of treatment. The opinions expressed are those of the discussants and do not reflect Fertility and Sterility or the American Society for Reproductive Medicine.